So this effigy is one of the, the great stylistic exemplars of its period. Um, it, you know, and, and stylistically, it dates very closely to circa 1440. Uh, the effigy itself was almost certainly carved between 1438 and 1441, the time of death. Um, and uh, it really, it's one of the best examples. In many aspects, it's, it shows everything that is most typical uh, of English style armor of this period. But it, it, it blends that, that typical silhouette with a number of really nice, unique, or, or idiosyncratic details as well. It shows us not just what the typical armor should look like, it also gives us a really nice sense of, of variance from individual armor to armor. And uh, I, I think also it's a really nice example to look at when you're actually interested in, in martial arts and fighting style. And you know, one of the things I've always been most keen to try and explore and emphasize in, in my work on, on effigies is that the design of armor, the specifics, the little details, you know, the, the fact that they wear one type of shoulder defense versus another, or the fact that they, you know, they, they wear a slightly longer skirt, or, or all of that, it all comes back to the specifics of how they're fighting, how they fight uh, in a group on the battlefield, are they fighting on foot or on horseback, who are they fighting, in what kinds of conditions, the armor really has to accommodate that, and it has to work very specifically uh, with the fighting styles involved. Uh, and this, this armor is a really nice example of that. It's a nice example of what you need to be wearing if you are an English knight fighting on foot in France in, in the mid-15th century. And it's a, it's a fascinating example of how you know, any armor design needs to find some kind of balance or harmony between the inversely proportional principles of protection and mobility. And that you need to be well armored. And the, one of the, the most basic tenets of the English style of armor design in this period is that they want the entire body to be covered in, in plates, as much plate armor as they can, that they can put onto the body. Uh, they need that protection. Uh, but at the same time, they're fighting on foot, so they can't, they can't have too much weight, and they need flexibility. They need to be able to fight with two-handed weapons, primarily. Uh, they, they need a, sort of a symmetrical design with really good mobility in the arms and shoulders and good dexterity in the fingers, at the same time as having good plate coverage. And that's a real design challenge because the, the English are basically saying we need the best possible protection of plate armor, but we also have to have great mobility and, and, and flexibility. And the English kind of seek to transcend the inverse proportional rule. You know, they don't want to decrease mobility when they increase protection. And they don't want to have to, to sacrifice protection for the sake of mobility. They want the best of both, and they're not really willing to compromise. Uh, and that leads them down some really interesting uh, paths. So Toby, looking at the specialized nature of English armor, one of the things I know that you mention um, in your book is the design of the armor for the feet and around the ankles and, and the greaves and such like. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great place to start with an English armor because the English almost invariably on the battlefield fought on foot. Um, not that they couldn't fight on horseback and not that they didn't, but it wasn't their typical modus operandi. You know, the, 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 the classic English way of fighting by this period was to deploy your, your men-at-arms on foot, interspersed, and working closely with the, with the archers. So that's the most fundamental issue that an armor design needs to deal with. You are fighting primarily on foot, and therefore you are going to weight everything about your design very heavily towards 
fighting on foot. Doesn't rule out fighting on horseback, but it's about, it's about emphasis. So what you do with the, with the foot protection is really important. And the English almost always wear plate sabatons. Uh, you just, when you're fighting on foot, you gotta have that. Uh, that you know, somebody's going to step on you. Some, somebody falling down is going to hit you. Something's going to... The feet are really vulnerable. You have to have <laughs> that protection. Even more so than on horseback. On horseback, you've got yeah. a stirrup, you know, and, and, and people aren't so worried about your feet in a way. Um, and I think people tend to just think about weapons deliberately hitting you in the feet, but actually right. things being dropped, people falling. Right. Imagine a 200-pound right. you know, armoured guy falling yeah. over on your foot. If your foot gets broken, you can't right. fight right. properly. It's a debilitating <laughs> thing. Um, so they need the plate protection. They've got to have that. But they also they need unimpeded movement in their feet. They're very concerned about uh, ankle mobility. So normally with a lot of continental sabatons, the, the sabaton will actually have like an articulated tongue or extension at the front and usually at the back that go up inside the greave, um, certainly by the, by the 15th century. Um, but that, that can start to limit the flexibility of the ankle a bit. And the English are never willing to allow that. They always kept uh, their sabatons cut low around the ankle. And on effigies, this is a little bit disturbed by the spur strap coming through there. But normally you see a big gap in here. And the artist here has, has sort of left this untreated or it's been worn away. But almost invariably you see mail in this gap, which tells you that the plates don't usually go up inside there. Usually this is cut low around the ankle and you've got mail covering the gap which allows you to ha still have complete freedom of movement in your ankle while still being you know, well protected. Uh, they also, interestingly, just a small, uh, another little English feature is how the front plate of the greave is extended around the ankle with this little ankle extension. You know, normally a continental greave will just go straight down, but the English uh -huh. are cutting around the ankle there. It's just. It's just kind of a, an English thing. Uh, and then similarly, drawing the greave out at the top to give you know, really good flexibility and movement and the range of movement. Do you think the shape of that um, front greave plate has um, a practical application? Do you think it's to hold it more securely onto the back one maybe? Or? Uh, I don't know. Um, I mean, my, my experience with reconstructing this stuff, I mean, I built some greaves uh, in, that, in that style. It does mm. make them a, a little harder to open. They don't open okay. as much, and you have to kind of sneak your legs into them. <laughs> um, I, I, don't know, I don't know what it gets you, really, but it's a distinctive English detail, mm. regardless. And, and just, I mean, for any viewers who aren't clear on this, the, generally speaking, the white alabaster would be steel. Yeah. And the, the, yeah. what's currently painted gold, and probably would well, have originally was, been yeah. painted yeah. gold, yeah. 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 Um, is representative of, oh, I suppose, Latin brass. Yeah, type. It, well, in the, in the documents, you get um, inventories that mention armor decorated with Latin bands, mm. and Latin is just copper alloy, it's just sort of brass basically. Yeah. Um, but then they also mention on finer armors, gilt Latin. Yeah. So I sometimes just say yellow metal because we know it's something, you know, quite A copper fancy alloy looking. of, yeah. Uh, it, could be, it could be gilded, it could be not, but regardless, it, it, looks, it looks good. Yeah. There's even reference to sometimes these decorated bands being made in silver or, or silver gilt. And, and this was a feature that continued on English armors till quite late, didn't it? But, yeah. but became yeah. less common on continental armors. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it keeps going in different ways and, and different decorative techniques go in and out of fashion uh, you know, all the time. You know, but even on you know, German Gothic armors in the late yeah. 15th century, yeah. they were still using yeah. applied copper alloy or gilt bands of different kinds. So it's one of these things that comes in and out and is treated in different ways. But the English are pretty typical in having quite long-term trends. You know, there's that old English thing of conservative. You know, you know don't change it <laughs> if there's nothing wrong with it. And they, they the English just you know, culturally tend to oppose the idea of change for its own sake, and we'll change something if we really have to. Yeah. But we like what we like, and we're going to keep it as long as we can. You know? <laughs> Um, so there, there, it's this fun, not to say that the English aren't inv innovative, they're tremendously innovative. And they come up with, with things that are, that are quite, 
you know, quite uh, distinctive. Mm. At the same time as they have, you know, certain visual cues that they, they like to hold on to. So if we move up the greaves, um, yeah. we've got some interesting features below the polynes, which are the, uh, the knee defenses, yeah. for those of you yeah. who don't know the terminology. So, so the knee part is called a, a polyne, 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 yeah. uh, polyne, and then you've got lames below and mm -hmm. lames above. Mm -hmm. But down here, we've got an interesting dagged or jagged yeah. edge. Yeah. What's, yeah. what's that all about? Well, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I mean, this, this is a specific characteristic that you only find in the late 1430s in England. And basically, this, this dagged toothed Plate. This is a this is an elongated uh, lame coming down from the articulation plates, and it just overlaps the greave, and then it's attached usually with turn pins that aren't shown on this particular example. Um, I think because he just wanted to, you know, he he took some of the technicalities off of this armor to maintain a sort of pure silhouette. Um, but this is meant to be an extended plate that is then attached, fastened onto the greave plates. Mm -hmm. So that's what ensures a good interaction with the whole leg defense, so that the knee can flex with the lower leg and, and so forth. And what they've done simply, a, a lot of times this plate, which is often called the demi-greave, I call yeah. it the demi-greave, um, in, in my work because it, you know, it is extending quite far down. This the being the grieve and then the that grieve. being the demi grieve. And this is yeah. like a half grieve, yeah. that, you know, or demi grieve. Um, anyway, this is part of this whole upper assembly. Normally this is just cut straight mm. on most effigies of this and slightly earlier. This is just cut straight across here and you see a line delineating the demi grieve from the grieve. Now here, just on these, a few examples of this period, you get this, um, this toothed uh, cut and um, it's a fancy bit of decoration basically mm. uh, it's interesting that if if you look at the the civilian or courtly um, fashions of the time of this particular period uh, they sometimes on on the elaborate hosen or leggings they like to put a zigzag band across this area sometimes uh. or they'll have a color transition so the upper part of the leg um, will be red and the lower leg will be blue or white or something. And then the transition of color will be a zigzag, flamboyant, you know, eye-catching, fashionable detail. And I think this is an example of the, 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 the latest modes in fashionable dress uh, kind of resonating onto the armor as well. Because armor's clothing, it has to be fashionable. It has to look good according to the the uh, the ideas of the time. Mm. So it's transferable, mm. and and it goes both ways. You know, sometimes you'll see things that arise as technical armor features that then get transferred onto civilian clothing, and you know, and vice versa. This yeah. is this is part armor is part of the whole fashionable environment, and so all of the same rules are in play. And sometimes there are things you can do with silk that you just can't do with metal, and vice versa. But sometimes there's ways of moving the motifs back and forth among the different materials. So moving up the legs to the uh, polanes, um, they really haven't changed an awful lot, have they, for, for a few decades now? No, I mean, I mean in this period, the wings are getting bigger. Uh -huh. Uh, they're, curving around yeah, more, they're getting, yeah they're getting more flowery they're getting more elaborate um so there's a tendency for them the to knee, lap around you know the, the knee is the yeah. knee and there's a yeah. functional limitation on what the armor can look like when it has to do its job um but sometimes they're rounder sometimes they're sharper i mean in the agincourt period the shape of the knee tended to be much more like a kind of axe blade it tended to be straight sided and much kind of sharper mm. Uh, and you sort of look like you could split wood with them. <laughs> um, and now they're becoming more gracefully rounded. They still have a sharp ridge, but they're becoming a bit more rounded and mm. a bit more, you know, dished. Uh, but the, the, the wings are getting bigger. And also in this period, this one, this one doesn't have them, but you're starting also to get more bigger use of interior wings as well on, mm. the, on the inside of the leg as well as on the outside. And that's, again, a, a concession to, to the... the 
the fighting on foot. Um, yeah, that was sort of something that surprised me in your book actually, was mm -hmm. because I'd never really noticed the inner wings, mm -hmm. or when I think mm -hmm. when I, if I'd seen them in art, I'd kind of excused it as an error. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But certainly, most reproduction armors tend to just have outside wings yeah. and then no wing yeah. on the inside. But it, yeah, it, I, presumably, it's an adaptation for fighting on foot to try and. You talk to people who fight on foot a lot now. Yeah. And you know, many of them will tell you that the 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 inner wings are a good idea. Yeah. You know, and your leading foot, your leading leg is that much mm. closer to your enemy, and he hits you in the knee, in the inside yeah. of the knee, and you're in real trouble. Well, and if exactly, if you are leading with one leg, if you're using a pole axe or anything else. Mm -hmm someone's as liable to hit the outside as or the inside right, they could hit right. from either side right. so you may as well have equal protection Absolutely. on both sides and it's again one of these things it's not to say you can't ride in an armor that has inner knee wings mm. but it's not ideal for no. riding and if you were optimizing your armor for fighting on horseback you wouldn't have the inner knee wings mm. so the the fact that the english are usually putting so much more plate into that area is one of the many indicators again that they're mainly concerned about fighting on foot and that same thing moves up from the knee to the thigh area itself and Almost universally in this period and all the way deep into the second half of the 15th century, the English wear fully enclosed cuisses. Mm. So they wear plates on the backs of their thighs as well as on the fronts. And that is a considerable uh, technical challenge to get those fitted well, so they're not too tight, but they're not too loose. Mm. They don't dig into the backs of your knees. They don't impede the movement of your hips and your glutes. Um, you know, that putting plates on the backs of the legs is a challenge and it's, it's one of the indicators of the very high um, technical proficiency uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the English armors or armor designers. Not to say that the fully enclosed cuisses weren't present on the continent, they were, yeah. but it wasn't an absolutely defining characteristic in the way that it was in England. And again, mm -hmm. It's, you, you can ride in fully enclosed cuisses as long as you have the right saddle. You do. I you? have. Yeah. Done it. But I'll say also it is not ideal. Right. If you're going to be spending the majority of your time on a horse, closed cuisses are not what you want. Mm. Uh, but you know, definitely for fighting on foot, it's a good idea. So we've talked about the cuisse, which is the, the plates around the thighs, front, front and back in, in this case. The natural thing to talk about next is this very characteristically long fold, yeah. which is the, yeah. the name for the skirt. Yeah. And that goes around the front and back and mm -hmm. is made of a series of um, essentially um, hoops yep. um, that hinge at one side and buckle at the other usually? Well, yeah, <laughs> sometimes. Uh, the, the sort of continental standard is to have a series of hinges going up the left side. Which is the, the side to what will get right, hit the most, right. yeah. And, then you, and the whole thing opens on the right side to accept the body and then closes and buckles around it. But the English didn't do that universally. The English sometimes put the hinges on the right side and buckled on the left. Mm. And sometimes they buckled on both sides. And sometimes they used loose pin clasps mm. that look like hinges but aren't. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes it so looks like they've got hinges on both it sides. It looks like they've but, got yeah. hinges on both sides but they don't. Um, so there's lots of variation in how the, yeah, the how the folds, yeah, yeah. but the, but characteristically in, in England, certainly in this period until about 1450 mm -hmm. or there are soon thereafter, they're long, aren't they? So very yeah, deep. Yeah, that's that's a really th this whole business of of how long should the skirt be mm. in conjunction of what kind of tassets is a really important question, and that's another one of the 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 core design issues that you need to make a decision about according to how you expect the armor to be used. So, you know, the longer skirt gets you greater protection, but it comes with it, it comes along with other issues. Um, it's important to remember too, you know, this is, take this for a, a late 1430s example. Tacits had only recently been invented. You cannot put tacits earlier than about 1425. And tassets are these independent these plates. These are the independent down here. plates that that are buckled onto the lower part of the skirt. In this period, they're on the lowest um, lame of the skirt, but they sometimes are attached a bit higher up or or, or in, in slightly different ways. Um, but the the tassets are a really important way of extending the plate protection 
from the skirt. But because this is one plate and this is another plate, when the legs flex, when the, when, the, when the legs spread or move, these plates can move out mm. in a way that the other skirt plates can't because mm. they're solid constructions. So the problem, with one, of the, one of the issues with, a long, with extending the skirt down to you know, almost the mid thigh is that it's gonna start to impede the movement uh, of the legs, the walking action, the running action, mm. the action of the legs in combat. That's a sacrifice in mobility that you accept to have this greater level of protection. And the tacit is a really important innovation in the 1420s because it allows you to extend that protection, but you allow your plate skirt to split mm. and to flare and to move with your legs. So it's, it's, an, important, it's an important development. Initially, they're just these sort of shallow oblong plates combined with a longer skirt, but later, fairly quickly, they realized that you could shorten the skirt a bit, make the tassets a bit longer, mm. and get a slightly better balance between protection and mobility. This is good protection, but it's limiting your mobility a little bit too much. And it's interesting to note that in England, these really long skirts, which of th this is the, the key exemplar, these didn't actually last for very long. Mm. Uh, they're, only, they're, they're only in use for, you know, 20 years at most, and a lot of people had stopped wearing them before that. Interestingly, they appear soon after the Battle of Agincourt. It's interesting to note that at that battle, um, the, the, uh, King Henry V's brother, one of his brothers, the Duke of Gloucester, Humphrey, the Duke of Gloucester, was stabbed in the groin or upper thigh <laughs> and was very badly wounded. And I can't, I can't prove it, but I can't stop myself wondering either, you know, that when celebrities get hurt, everyone sits up and pays attention. Um, Especially if and, they're stabbed in the groin. And if they stab in the groin, yeah, <laughs> people are going to hear about that. And people are going to kind of empathize with that. And think, Dude, Dude yeah. let's get some new armor. You know? And it's funny that the, the skirts in England get longer pretty rapidly after Agincourt. And, and Humphrey was probably not the only one who was getting stabbed in the groin. This is an issue. When you start to get English knights this heavily armed, there's only so many places you can stab them and, ex mm. and expect to get a good effect. Yeah. Uh, and the groin is always going to be one of those places. And there's lots of other examples of, of instances I've talked about in the book where you know, men are, are, are they're actively stabbing the legs, going for the upper legs uh, or the groin, because that's one of the few places that you know, armored men are still pretty yeah. vulnerable. And this is really, I mean, for, for people who don't have any direct experience of armor or, or fighting in armor or against people in armor, it's just so, so difficult to wound someone mm -hmm. in armor. Armor really does its job. There's, yeah. there's so few openings. And yeah, aside from a very large pole weapon you know, or heavy, something like a pole axe or a halberd, um, or, or really getting in and wrestling and getting a rundle dagger in a gap or something. And even then that's difficult because a lot of the gaps mm -hmm. have mail in them and mm -hmm. uh, an arming doublet underneath and things. Yeah, it's really it, difficult. It's it, funny too, again, again, trying, I mean, I always try in my own work to kind of marry, you know, the academic side of inquiry with, you know, my interests as a practitioner mm. and trying to get the two to inform each other a bit more. And I know as, you know, a practitioner uh, who has been injured in armor that you often don't know that you've been injured mm. until significantly later. Mm. Uh, you know, armor, armor limits your senses in all kinds of ways. You can't see very much. You can't hear very much. You're hot. Uh, you, you get hot, <laughs> yeah. and and you're insulated from the outside world, and you can't feel a lot of stuff too. And uh, mm. and taking that into account, as well as the the stimulating environment of, of combat, you know, um, you know, I had a really significant hand injury in a joust a few years ago, but uh, I didn't know. I, I I had felt a dull impact, but it didn't seem to be any big deal. And meanwhile, my lances are covered in blood and my, you know, my ground crew are starting to get pretty concerned. And they ask me, you know, are you hurt? And I say, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And they're looking at my blood. But don't ask the guy in armor. He doesn't know what's going on, you know. So even if you are injured in this kit, you know, it, it holds you together. And, 
you might not know it for a while. And if you don't know your hurt, unless it's really bad, mm. it's not going to stop you. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon, or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.